How do we prevent concussions? concussions? Well, first thing we need to do is focus on eliminating those behaviors that we've identified as being mechanisms of concussion. For example, we have to make sure that we try to reduce hits to the head or illegal activities. We also need to teach our young athletes the technical skills, how to skate, how to actually control their body, how to keep their head up. So they have this heightened awareness of a, con a collision that may be ready to occur, and they can protect themselves from that type of injury. We need to have all our athletes and coaches conform to the existing rules, which are put in place in part for safety reasons. And of course, we want our officials to consistently enforce the rules as they're written. Unfortunately, helmets do not prevent concussions. They may play a role. We are fortunate that they do perform the function they were designed to, which is to prevent a skull fracture and a bleed into the head called an intracranial hematoma. But there is no current evidence to prove that a helmet can actually reduce or prevent concussions in hockey. We are interested also in neck strengthening. We feel it's important for coaches to teach their athletes neck strengthening because it may be possible to tense the neck muscles when you anticipate a collision, which may reduce some of the force transmission to the head and therefore the brain. So it's something that we're researching, but it should be part of all the strength and conditioning programs for our hockey players. Mouth guards play an important role to reduce the risk of dental injury and facial trauma but they have not been conclusively shown to reduce the risk of concussion. Further research is necessary to determine if some of the newer models, which actually have good results in a laboratory, will actually translate to reducing concussions on the ice. There are many behavioral modification programs which have outcome data to show that they reduce the risk of certain behaviors that can cause concussions, like the fair play program, which will dissuade athletes from taking penalties because it affects the outcome of their game. There are a variety of rule changes and enforcement of existing rules which are important to reduce the risk of a concussion. We need to teach body control, angling, body checking in practice where we know the risk of injury is much less than a game. We need to delay body checking in games until the bantam level so athletes are better prepared to give and take a body check. We need to eliminate head contact, including intentional and unintentional blows to the head, because we realize this is the most common mechanism of a concussion in hockey. And we need to eliminate fighting at the junior level. The purpose of a fight is to cause a blow to the head and to render your opponent unconscious in the sport of boxing. And we do not need fighting in youth hockey. How do you diagnose a concussion? Well, first of all, you need to look for signs and symptoms. The symptoms of a concussion can be found on a coaching clipboard, for example. You can carry a clipboard around. The CDC has a clipboard program. There's also what's called the SCAT 2 card, and it can remind you of which symptoms you want to ask your athletes about if you're concerned about a concussion. Typical symptoms include headache, nausea, loss of balance, dizziness, double or blurred vision, decreased concentration, loss of memory, light or noise sensitivity, sluggish, foggy, or a groggy feeling, or even confusion. Signs of a concussion would be when you observe that your player appears kind of dazed or stunned. They may be confused about their assignment. They may miss their line change or forget where to position themselves on the ice. They may skate differently. They appear a little more clumsy. They answer questions slowly. They may have behavioral or personality changes. They may be more emotional. They may be kind of giddy or sometimes kind of uh, emotional like crying. They may be unsure of the score or even who they're playing. They may lose their memory. They can't recall events that happened after the injury, which is called antegrade amnesia, or they may forget events that occurred before the injury, which is called retrograde amnesia. What happens if a player's down on the ice 
and you're the first responder, you're the coach that runs out on the ice. Well, the first thing you have to determine is, is, is the player responsive. If the player cannot respond to your commands, call for help. Dial 911. All unconscious athletes need to be transported to an emergency department. If the player is unresponsive and isn't breathing, you'll have to start CPR. You have to resuscitate as necessary. Never move the athlete. Don't remove their helmet unless you need to get access to their airway and you can't otherwise. And never rush the evaluation. The game doesn't matter anymore. We need to do what's best for this down athlete. You should always assume a neck injury until proven otherwise. Don't have the athlete sit up or skate off until you've determined that they have no neck pain, they have no pain or numbness or tingling in their arms or legs, they have no tenderness to palpation if you touch along the midline of their cervical spine and they're exquisitely tender, that would be an alarming sign. Make sure they have normal muscle strength, just have them squeeze your fingers, wiggle their toes, make sure they can feel their fingers in their toes. Once you determine they're conscious, they're responsive, they're answering your questions, they don't have symptoms or signs of a serious neck injury, then you help them off the ice, you take them into the locker room. It's best if they're examined away from the bench. You perform an evaluation and make sure somebody stays with them. Never leave an athlete alone who has just sustained a concussion. You ask them questions. How do you feel? Ask about the concussion symptoms. Do you have a headache? Is your vision blurred? And then you do a, a brief exam. You ask them orientation questions. What day is it? What's the score? Who are we playing? What period is it? Ask them about something that happened before the game. What did you have for breakfast? What did you do in school today? You can then inquire about their immediate memory. You just give them a list of words, five words off the top of your head. Ask them to repeat them and see how many of those words they can remember immediately and repeat for you. You can next check their concentration. Ask them to give you the months of the year in reverse order or count backwards from 100 by threes and see if they can concentrate enough to carry out that task. And for different age levels, you may wish to ask a little more difficult questions. Check their balance, which is very simple. Have them stand on both legs or even one leg with their eyes closed for 20 seconds and see if they fall over if they can't maintain their balance standing with two or one leg with their eyes closed. And you can also check delayed recall. You can tell them, I'm going to give you uh, three words and later I'm going to ask you what I said. So if you say puck and sky and automobile, and then later they have to tell you those three words that you gave them. You can do the same thing with numbers. You're trying to test their delayed recall. Now, when do you have to take an uh, injured athlete, a concussed athlete to the hospital? That's very rare, actually. We usually just can observe them and see how they do. But if a patient is knocked out unconscious for longer than five minutes, if on exam they have a focal neurologic deficit, like they have weakness in one of their arms or their pupils are of different sizes, if they seem to be getting worse, they're getting more groggy, more confused, they're getting a more severe headache. If they have uncontrolled vomiting, if you suspect a skull fracture or a more serious injury, or if they're having a seizure, we'd recommend emergency transport to a hospital. That completes the video portion of this segment. Now, let's move on.